Yo, this got started with the show. So for all of my listeners out there, uh, this is Marcia and you are watching. I mean, you are listening to voiceitradio.com. And on the line, we have Dr. Umar Johnson. And um, of course, you know, I, I know you know who he is. I mean, come on. If you don't know who Dr. Umar is, I don't know where you've been. Um, but he is an educator. He's a psychologist. He's a political scientist. And most of all, he is a Pan-Africanist. And from what I was just saying to you all, it's something that I definitely uh, believe that we need. So how are you doing today, Dr. Umar? Okay, great. Now, uh, we've just started our conversation right at the, um, at the time for our first break. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And uh, listeners, please um, join me uh, after the break. And like I said, you can call in at 216-694-8910. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, and join me back here with Dr. Umar after the break. Um, and that's Dr. Umar Johnson. Hello, uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, you on the phone? Uh, yes, good afternoon, sister. Peace and love to you and to the entire Ohio family. Yes, thank you. Um, so how are you today? You doing good? Yes, ma'am. All is well. Joining you from Philadelphia, uh, preparing to head on down to Washington, D.C. later this evening, where I'll be speaking tomorrow at the Thurgood Marshall Center. And if there's anyone listening to the broadcast who's joining you from Washington, D.C., who intends to come to the program tomorrow, I would advise them to go ahead and get their tickets because there's only about 25 left. Mm -hmm. We're about to sell out, so hopefully they'll go ahead and take advantage of the opportunity while it exists. Thank you so much for joining us today. And, um, you know, as you know, this show is about race and race relations, so I thought you would be the perfect uh, guest to have on the program. Um, and I wanted to have you tell the audience, who may not be familiar with you, uh, just your background in education and um, the the how education ties in with the issues um, that black people are suffering through um, in the education uh, system. Uh, certainly. Uh, I'm a doctor of clinical psychology, certified school psychologist, former school principal, currently in the process of building the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG Leadership Academy for Black Boys. And as a school psychologist, I basically evaluate children. That's what I do professionally. And I determine whether or not they are eligible for special education. Our school psychologists, we're considered the gatekeepers of special education because we decide through our, through our testing and our recommendations, we decide who goes into special ed, we help decide how long they stay in special ed, and we help decide who leaves special ed. We also evaluate for mental giftedness. And so uh, school psychologists are basically the professionals of special education. Special education created school psychology as a profession uh, for the most part, and so that's what I do. Unfortunately, less than 1% of all school psychologists in America are African. That means that 99% of the people putting our children in special ed by way of autism, by way of emotional disturbance, by way of the ever-popular learning disability, by way of ADHD and deafness and blindness and orthopedic impairments and all of the 13 federal special ed disabilities, most of the people putting our kids in special ed do not look like them. Now, when we talk about education, we have to understand something. Black children are deliberately miseducated. This is on purpose. It is not an accident. It is by deliberate intent. It is important that we understand that because too often we fail to address the issues affecting our children vis-a-vis -vis academic racism because of our misunderstanding of the problem itself. A lot of black people, especially bourgeoisie blacks and blacks who are in the educational power structure, and let me be clear, most blacks in the educational power structure are bourgeoisie blacks. So there's a disconnect between the needs of black children 
and the black administration that oversees the schools because many of our black administrators have the same mindset as middle-class uh, European America. Mm-hmm. And so to properly educate a black child, if you properly educate a black child, you bring about political economic revolution in America because America is a racial hierarchy, white on the top, brown in the middle, black on the bottom. We're supposed to stay at the bottom. The only way you can guarantee that we stay in our place is if you miseducate our children. If you properly educate black children, you prepare them to go from the bottom to the top. And that's why public school is designed to fail. And I suppose I'm... I'm assuming that that's exactly why you felt like it was time to start your own academy, um, which you have mentioned. Uh, So what do you think that you will offer at your academy that's basically non-existent in the public school system? Yes, ma'am. There'll be four things, more than four, but I'll give you four things uh, that will separate the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy from every other school on planet Earth, not just public school, not just parochial school, not just charter school, not just independent school, not just the African Senate schools around the country. But what will separate FDMG from all of those, including other Afrocentrics, is number one, it will be an unapologetically African institution. So we're not preparing black children to fit within the American power structure. We are not preparing them to serve within the American power structure. We are preparing them to be captains of their own political and economic destiny. So when you look at HBCU uh, structure, when you look at structure of public school, all academic institutions that serve black children prepare them for one thing, to effectively serve white people, whether you're serving them with a high school diploma, whether you're serving them with a bachelor's degree, whether you're serving them with a master's degree, or whether you're serving them with a doctorate degree, you are still serving because the institutions that prepare us do not prepare us for wealth acquisition and power control. Mm. If you want to properly empower black people, you have to teach them wealth acquisition, financial management, power control. When you're just working for people, you don't have to worry about power control. When you're just working for people, you don't have to worry about wealth acquisition. You don't have to worry about that. So our education is a servant education. So FDMG is going to do away with that. Number two, our school will emphasize African spirituality as a foundation. The school will not be religious, but we want to make sure our children understand how their ancestors dealt with God way before anyone by the name of Abraham, Jesus, or Muhammad were ever born. It is important that we really begin to integrate the two key aspects of African spirituality into our life and into our revolutionary struggle. And those two key aspects of African spirituality, which separates it from religion, is number one, ancestral veneration. There is no ancestral veneration in Islam. There is no ancestral veneration in Christianity. There is no ancestral veneration within the Hebrew faith. And I respect all of them. I see no problems with them. But as African people, we need to add that ancestral veneration because we're not going to get out of the situation by turning our backs on the everyday living presence of our ancestors. And the second aspect of African spirituality that separates it from mainstream religion is the fact that we believe in divination. We believe that we can get answers to our problems in the here and now. We believe that every one of us is born with a specific purpose that you can only tap into through divination. And then the third thing I would add, although I said two, the third I would add is the balance between masculine and female divinity. There is no female divinity in Islam. There is no female divinity in Christianity. There is no female divinity in the Hebrew faith. All those religions strip the woman of her divinity. And it is important that we as African people approach God in a very balanced way, because if your spirituality is out of balance, so will everything else be. The third thing that will separate FDMG from all other institutions is our curriculum. The six core areas of FDMG. I'm not going to mention math. I'm not going to mention science. I'm not going to mention language. I'm not going to mention history. The reason I'm not going to mention those four is because they are required. Every school in America has to have those four. So they don't even have to be mentioned. But on top of those four, we will have an agricultural and agronomical curriculum where we teach the children the science of the soil, how to grow your own food, how to test that soil. We want every child to be a 
George Washington Carver by the time they graduate. And then we will have an economic and financial curriculum where your child will know how to do their own taxes before they finish the ninth grade. They will have their own business plan before they finish the 10th grade. They will be trading stock on Wall Street before they finish the 11th grade. And they will have mastered real estate in their home state by the time they graduate. We're talking about economic revolution. We want them to be a living Dr. Claude Anderson by the time they graduate. The next curriculum will be political and military science. We want to make sure our children understand white supremacy, white racism. They need to understand why homosexuality is being pushed. They need to understand why uh, Donald Trump is in office without any political experience. Why Obama was put in office with very little political experience. Why is it that Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth, but yet the people are in the poorest condition? They have to understand the political economic time of day. So we want them to be living, breathing Dr. Amos Wilson's. And then we go to... From that, we go to the science of the black family and science of the black community. We want to teach our boys how to be husbands, how to be fathers, how to be leaders of the community, how to be real men. We want to teach our daughters because we will be opening up an Anna Douglas, Amy Garvey female academy once the boys academy is up and running. We cannot leave out the sisters because, again, our whole cultural foundation coming from our spiritual foundation, is based on balance of masculine and feminine energy. So we want to make sure the daughters know how to be women, how to be mothers, how to be leaders. And obviously, as a man, I won't be teaching them that. It will be the sisters who will be teaching them that. And then we go to our next curriculum, which will be um, science of African uh, diet and nutrition. So agronomy, we're going to teach them how to grow their own food, but with dietary and nutritional science, we're going to teach them how to heal the human body without Western pharmaceuticals. Black people are overly dependent on Western pharmaceuticals to heal disease. And all the Western pharmaceuticals do is serve as a Band-Aid that gives us a comfortable death. So we take these pills not to heal, but just so they can soothe us long enough until we die so they can uh, sell our organs off. Uh, the school is going to be thoroughly based on the principles of revolutionary Pan-African nationalism as taught by the king of Pan-Africanism, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. It will be thoroughly based on a African culture that is not just about dashikis and drums, but truly understanding the inner essence of who we are as a people. And ultimately, sister, I want it to be a residential school. Uh, we might not be able to start with a residential school due to, to limited funding, but the long-term vision will be a residential school. In fact, I'll be going to Atlanta, Georgia, next week to look at another school that is for sale down there. I looked at a school last week. So I'm just looking for that first school, but I promise uh, our people with the help of the Most High and the support of the ancestors that we will have a school in 2017. I'm committed to that. Wow, that's that's like revolutionary progressive like because I would have loved to attend a school such as this. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who's having questions about how they can support or maybe contribute um, to raising funds for that. Do you have information on that? Uh, yes. Uh, donations can be um, uh, offered two ways. One way is online, gofundme.com forward slash Dr. Umar. Again, gofundme.com slash D-R-U-M-A-R. The other way is by mailing in a check or money order payable to FDMG Academy, which can be sent to P.O. Box 6872, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19132. If anyone did not catch that, they can email me for the details at drumarjohnson.com, D-R-U-M-A-R-J-O-H-N-S-O-N, drumarjohnson.com, the website, or directly, drumarjohnson at yahoo.com, where they can send me a text message at 215-989-9858, and I can send them that information. We've raised over $700,000 uh, for the school. Uh, it's not a whole lot of money, but it is definitely a successful amount of money, all of that coming from the hands of black people. Uh, probably soon we'll be crossing a million, but if it's up to me, we will have already purchased the school before we even get to a million. I would like to take 500000 of that to acquire a facility 
Uh, there's also a possibility that I might lease the school instead of buying a school. Uh, so if we go with a lease situation, we will be in an even better position if we go with a lease situation because you're looking at a 10000 somewhere between an eight to $15,000 a month lease. So if we go with a lease situation, we would have enough money to successfully operate the school for about two, three years by the time the tuition begins to kick in and other fundraising initiatives to sustain us beyond that. So the lease situation isn't out of the question because if we go that way, we will definitely have enough capital saved up to really do what we need to do for our young people. Okay, great. Thank you for all of that information. Um, I wanted to get into uh, some questions. Um, The first question that I wanted to ask you is, uh, what do you see um, the biggest problem being um, that our society faces when it comes to racism, white supremacy? Okay, I would say that the biggest problem that we as African people have as it relates to racism is we do not understand it. In other words, there's a lot of black people who would argue to you right here, right now, that racism does not exist. Now, obviously, with the election of Donald Trump and the propaganda surrounding him, there will probably be very few black people you could find to say that now. But if we go, if we go back, you know, during these eight years of the Obama administration, Many black people will say, get over it. It's over. We have a black president. There is no more racism because they have been thoroughly brainwashed and confused about the symbols that America uses to give the illusion of inclusion. But when you thoroughly understand racism, you understand that racism is as prominent today as it was on the day that our ancestors arrived as enslaved Africans. Racism is about power. Racism is about control. Racism is about authority. Racism is about privilege. Racism is about domination. It is about dominating any group that the in-group sees as a threat to their uh, continued control. So when you look at racism from what it is, which is a system of power, a system of power that is discriminately applied to keep other all other groups powerless while those in power continue to amass more power. Racism is a monopoly. It is a narcissistic system. It is a sociopathic system. It is a psychopathic system because it will do anything necessary, anything necessary to guarantee that white people remain in control. So they control the schools. They control the prisons. They control the economic system. They control the media. They control uh, the images that we see on the television. They control the publishing houses. They control the music. They control it all. And they control it in such a way that glorifies them as the race. That should naturally be in control. That's the propaganda message. We're so great that you guys should be happy that we're in control. And in contradiction to that, black people are so weak, so negative, so retarded, so dysfunctional, that it should be totally acceptable when you see police kill unarmed black folks. Because after all, the world would be better off without black folks. Racism is about power. It has nothing to do with black presidents. It has nothing to do with you being able to buy Mercedes Benz. It has nothing to do have it with, uh, to do with you marrying a white woman or having a PhD from Harvard. Racism is not about empty symbols. Racism is about who controls the political economic destiny of all other people. And with that, with what you're saying, it it makes me think about um, the video that I watched uh, maybe a week or so after um, President Elect Trump. Um, made his uh, grand um, acceptance speech. Um, the alt-right um, um, white nationalist uh, came out with a video. Um, I believe his name was Spencer. Um, I'm not sure his last name. But they, a video emerged of them celebrating um, Donald Trump's victory. And they actually were speaking about what you were just talking about and I wanted to read one of the statements um, that uh, was taken from um, his speech. Uh, He said, white people do not exploit other racial groups. White people do not gain anything from the presence of people of color. They need us and not the other way around. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, we know that's not to be true. Uh, Europeans uh, socially, historically, and politically have always been a parasitic group of people. Europe has very little to offer the rest of the world. 
So how does a people that come from a climate in a geographical location that doesn't have much to offer the rest of the world, how did they come to take over the world? It is because they systematically or sabotaged, they systematically destroyed, they systematically exterminated, they systematically conducted campaigns of war against other less lesser organized peoples in order to come to the position that they are in. If the European is king of anything, he is king of being organized and he is king of deception. Mm-hmm. As Marcus Garvey said, the most organized people are the ones who are always rule this world. And there's only one group of people that are more organized than the European right now, and that is the Chinese. And unfortunately, I believe that as the European power structure falls globally, the Chinese are going to come into domination globally. The the, the big issue for the white man right now is how do we destabilize the Chinese so we can perpetuate white power? Because the Chinese have more money, they have more people, they have more political, economic, militaristic sophistication. And so that is the new Cold War, the white man versus the brown man for who will control the black man. And that is literally so, because China and America are in a tug of war over Africa's resources. I just came back from Africa. I just came back from the Caribbean. I was the keynote speaker in Jamaica for the Marcus Garvey celebration this past August. And I can tell you that the Chinese are buying up the Caribbean like a dollar store. The Chinese are buying up Africa like a dollar store. In fact, the Chinese are invading South Africa so much that they have influenced the government of South Africa, the party of Nelson Mandela, the ANC, to make Mandarin, which is an Asian language, a, a mandatory language in public schools, and Chinese have actually been uh, reclassified as citizens of South Africa. So the, Chi- so the Chinese are giving the white man a very serious problem for who's going to control Africa for the next 50 to 75 years. Because as we know, whoever controls Africa controls the world. That statement made by that white nationalist was totally incorrect. White people have stolen everything that they have gotten, and they have given the world very little except military pop. That's the only thing that they've given this world is technological innovation. Now, I don't want to take away from the fact that they've invented the, help, the airplane. I don't want to take away the fact that the white man has, uh, has he's participated in some evolutionary ideas that have come to the benefit of all people. I will admit that. But most of what he's given the world has not been technological sophistication, it was black people who invented the Internet and the cell phone. Most of what the white man has given the world is war, pain, and genocide. And this is why the vampire, the vampire is one of the greatest mythical characters in European culture. They love the vampire. Why? Because the vampire is a psychological, okay, symbolic archetype of what the white man is. A vampire cannot survive unless he drinks the blood of another person. So by nature... Vampires are parasitic, and the reason why the vampire archetype is so prominent in European culture is because Europeans, just like their vampire, are also parasitic. Now, you have mentioned numerous times that for black people to survive and to come from underneath all of this, we have to have a strong economic base. And something that you just um, talked about with China and how they're buying up everything and, you know, we got to deal with them now and we got to deal with white people what is a i just don't i'm kind of curious on how can we come from underneath this when we so we are so far down you know um where are we going to get these funds from because you know i'm seeing here thinking that you know white people i mean black people are having a difficult times because white people won't spend money with black people and um how are we going to get from underneath this if we if no one will um, purchase our goods or our services. Look, okay. Let me be clear about this, and I want your entire listening audience to hear this well. Nothing can stop black people except black people themselves. Mm-hmm. There is nothing whites or Chinese, Arabs, East Indians, or Latinos can do to stop Africans when we decide to rise collectively. Our biggest obstacle after racism itself is our own psychological dependence on white people for approval. We have a psychological dependence on white folk. In fact, the psychological enslavement of African people, okay, uh, for the approval of white folks is probably greater than the physical enslavement of African people. We need their approval. Mm -hmm. This is how sick we've become. Black people do not believe that they can exist 
with our white folks. You hear black people say it all the time. If we had our own communities, if we had our own country, if we had our own society, all we would do is destroy them. We would bootleg them. We would uh, break them down, tear them apart. So we have to look at how psychologically we defend the status quo. Black people are totally committed to keeping white people in control. We are in love with white people. And until we admit that we are still in love with white folks, we won't be able to change this. Remember, there must be a psychological separation before there can be a physical separation. There must be a psychological revolution before there can be a political revolution. There must be a psychological transformation before there can ever be a material transformation. The first level of war is mental. The first stage of war is mental. Until we free the African collective consciousness from this love, addiction, and parasitic need for approval from white people, we can never fix this. Okay. And that is why schools are important. We have to transform the mind of blacks. And the only way you're going to do that is through the next generation. Why? Because, let's face it, people do not change. Most adults are resistant to change. The ego is not a oh, big supporter Hold on, of Dr. change. Hold on, Dr. because we have That's to take why. a break. Go ahead, I'm sorry. We have to take a break, and I know you're about to get into something really deep. So we're going to go ahead and take this break. This is Marcia. You're listening to VoiceOfRadio.com. And um, this is Civil Rights and Civil Wrongs. We'll see you here right after the break about black people having the need to be accepted by white people and needing their approval and he was just getting into the ego um dr umar can you continue with your point that you were making uh yes ma'am uh we have to realize that psychologically we've never rehabilitated from slavery there was never a period of healing there was never a period of uh, reclamation of ancient and technological cultural awareness. So we are, for all intents and purposes, of the same exact mental state today that we were when we got out of slavery. And despite all of the great information that we have at our fingertips about the greatness of African history, that really hasn't done much to transform our thinking and behavior. So what can we do about not that? It was not inculcated into us psychologically. In other words, we were not socialized with that information. We were simply taught it. And the only way that information becomes a living, breathing part of who you are is if it is socialized within you through ritual, through habit, through regular everyday practices. You have to socialize. It's like when someone goes into the military, you are socialized. You're not just taught the beliefs about being a soldier. You are through the behaviors of being a soldier. It is information plus behavior. But and that is Omar, that let, never was can I ask you something? Yes. Okay, because you're talking about socialization, and I feel like that is the one of the biggest problems that we have. Because when I think about media, when I think about um, the social uh, media websites and um, networking, um, how I'm finding it very difficult with socialization because a lot of times I feel alone in my um, struggle to learn more to be better because it seems like everyone around me is totally happy with fashion and entertainment and sports and anything else other than becoming stronger, becoming more intelligent, um, just just growing. So how can we change that element of socialization when we are just inundated by all of the, these attacks? Well, here's the thing. Again, we don't want out of the matrix. Black people are comfortable. Think of a child. A child isn't concerned about bills. A child isn't concerned about war. A child isn't concerned about power. A child isn't concerned about politics or economics. A child wakes up, does what he's told, and spends the rest of his time playing. Think about it. A child's life is totally controlled by the adults, okay? And most of the time he's doing exactly what the adults tell him to do. And when he's done that, he spends any leftover time simply having fun. That is exactly what black people do under white supremacy. We go to work because we have things to pay. We are told what to do and how to do it. And as soon as we get off the work, we want to go have drinks. We want to go party. Uh, we, we love 
to simply play because we do not have a mature consciousness. We do not have a nationalist consciousness. We do not have a collective consciousness. We do not think maturely about political political economic issues, and we have never been asked to do so. Slavery was all about looking out for the white man's best interests. That's what slavery was. You were not given any time to think about yourself, and we're still in that mindset 151 years after slavery. We don't really care about power and control. We just need a little bit enough elbow room so I could get my hair done, buy me some shoes, go get my freak on, go to the club, buy a nose house, and for the average black person, that is life. So how can we... Because life is so much greater than that. How can we move to get these people more involved? Because... um, of course, that is the big question. How can we get them more engaged and want to do more for their own best interest? I don't think that we should be spending too much time on adults. Mm-hmm. I really think one of our biggest mistakes that we continue to perpetuate year after year is focusing so much time on trying to change adults. Adults do not change, okay? And I speak of that from the perspective of a psychotherapist. Most people who go to therapy will not be helped. That is a psychological scientific fact. Most people who go to therapy, whether it's sexual problems, depression, suicide, bipolar, borderline, schizophrenia, uh, crackheads, whatever the case may be, most people will not change because people do not. Habits are hard to break. You've been formulating your habits across your lifetime. And when you look at the dysfunctional political and economic habits of black people, they are intergenerational. In other words, I'm not the first generation in my family who's been in love with white folks. I'm not the first generation in my family who worships uh, materialism. I'm not, I'm not the first person um, in my family who thinks blonde hair and blue eyes is the most beautiful thing so, under the sun. This is an intergenerational phenomenon. It's, so, it's generations of dysfunctional behavior piled up on top of each other. If it is hard to eliminate mental illness in one generation, it's going to be even harder to eliminate a composite of mental illness from several different generations collectively put together. I believe that 75% of our energy needs to be directed to those who are 25 years of age or younger. They have not yet solidified their core beliefs. They have not yet solidified their ideals. They're still finding their way in the world. Those are the Africans that we need to be working with. But instead of working with the youth, most of us will waste a hundred percent of our time trying to change people who are above the age of 30. And trying to change people above the age of 40 is absolutely ridiculous. we got to understand that not all Africans are going to go along for this struggle. A lot of us have this utopic ideal that all 40 million blacks in America are just going to somehow come together. You have never had a group of people anywhere, any race, any time, including the Bible, that were able to come together all under the same umbrella and push for what was right for them. You'll never get that amongst black people. We have to find the ones who are salvageable. Find the adults who can still be reached and brought into a conscious commitment of what needs to happen. Not just consciousness. Consciousness alone doesn't do anything. That's what's wrong with the black conscious community. They're all conscious, but very few of them are committed to doing anything to improve the situation for black people. Focus on the adults. Excuse me, focus on the children, find the adults you can reach, and leave the others. So I I totally agree with you, especially in regards to the children, the youth. Uh, but I do have a question. I wanted to know, in your own situation, your own life, the mission that you're on, what do you do when you're interacting with um, these people that you say are not salvageable or when you're trying to connect with other people like you? How do you navigate through that? Well, first, I'm always uh, studying uh, the people I come in contact with. Uh, Constant assessment has to be done by all of us, with all of us. You have to constantly evaluate and assess the people you come in contact with to see whether or not they can be of any use to the work that I'm trying to do. One of the most difficult problems that I have and what I do is being who I am is I attract a lot of people who are not sincere sincerely interested in helping me with the school. They're not sincerely interested in helping with the National Independent Black Parent Association. They simply join 
so that they can get the type of attention they need or the type of social network traffic that they desire. And then once they feel that they have garnered enough attention by using me as a platform, they then separate and spin off and do their own thing. So we have a lot of opportunists. Okay, my biggest problem is, is, is I have to constantly study the people around me to find out who is an opportunist and who is not. Uh, usually I can uh, spot an opportunist, but sometimes, okay, the opportunists are so good at how they package themselves to you mm-hmm. that they can actually come off as a sincere person when they're actually just another hustler looking to make a name for themselves at your expense. So it's a tough job. But that's just the way it has to be. I have to keep going forward and keep on finding the brothers and sisters who I really think are into this. Let's be clear. Church has killed the willpower of black people to use their own energy and talent and resources to impact their reality. Church has brainwashed 99.99% of us. And when I say church, I'm talking about all black religions. I'm talking African spirituality, I'm talking Islam, I'm talking Hebrew, I'm talking all black religions. So church, church for me is collective. Church has brainwashed us into thinking that we don't have to do anything except believe the right way, think the right way, pray the right way, and all of our problems will work out for themselves. And because of that, the average black person doesn't have a lot of conscious commitment to help make things right for us. We will go to a couple meetings. We will go to a couple of of serious uh, think tanks and round tables. But when it comes to actually implementing the work, very few of us will be there for that. We are not committed to ourselves. And we got to admit that. That's why we haven't... It's not a secret. We can solve every problem we have. Every problem we have is, is, is solvable. The problem ain't the problem. The problem is you don't have enough black people in this country who are willing to sacrifice time, money, and expertise without being compensated. And I need to underline that. Without being compensated for the greater good of black people. We are more capitalist than the capitalist and more European than the European. Do you have any suggestions on how to resolve that issue? Because I see exactly what you're saying. I I experience it um, when I'm trying to deal with people. I feel like a lot of my time is being wasted and uh, people aren't really committed, as you have said. Do you have any suggestions on how to get people to be unified? To um, I feel like a lot of the um, people also are jockeying for to be the boss, to be the person in charge. And so we get nowhere. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to get control over that commitment issue of these people who say that they're conscious, they're down for the cause, um, but we just never get anywhere? Well, number one, first rule of psychology, you don't study what people say, you study behavior. You don't study what people say, you study behavior. You come to me for therapy and I ask you, are you happy? You say you are. But your entire body, your entire body language communicates to me that you are unhappy. The only reason why I asked you if you were happy is I wanted to see whether or not you would be honest in this therapeutic relationship. So I don't care what people say. I don't care how they talk. I don't care how they dress. Okay, you have a lot of self-hating Negroes running around with dashikis, African names, a locks in their hair, veggie wrap, and two pounds of shea butter and an African drum. That doesn't mean anything to me. Study people's behavior, not their look and not their dress. But to reiterate, I would go back to What I've already said, the two things. Number one, find the people you can reach. You cannot change nobody. Find the ones that you can reach. It sounds to me that you might be spending too much time with people whose minds are already made up. Mm. Minds that are already made up. When someone comes into therapy, uh, and I keep using a therapy um, you know what? metaphor, not just because Dr. I am. Umar, I am so sorry to cut you off, but I want you to get out your information because the show is done. It's over. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to get out all of your contact information and your sure, upcoming sure. events. No problem. Uh, people can reach me at area code 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858. Uh, tickets for my upcoming events in Washington. Uh, D.C., Jacksonville, Florida, Detroit, Michigan, Atlanta, Georgia, Los Angeles, California, Raleigh, North Carolina. You can go to Eventbrite and type in Prince Ifatunde. I repeat, go to Eventbrite and type in my page, Prince Ifatunde, 
or you can go to princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. Also, let you, I want your parents to know that every Tuesday morning I host a free black parent teleconference. Any questions about their child, they can call in 6 to 8 in the morning and get free expert advice from yours truly. And again, I can be reached at drumarjohnson.com. We also have the Black College and Consciousness Tour coming up for 11 to 17-year-old boys and girls, uh, June 28th to July the 12th. All of that information and more, they can send me a message at drumarjohnson.com. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. you on the show today. And uh, for all my listeners out there, this is Marcia. And you are listening to, or you were listening to, Civil Rights and Civil Wrongs here on VoiceOfRadio.com.